Okay. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our latest HashiCorp snapshot on using uh, Consul to connect Kubernetes to the outside world, which will be presented by Dan Kirkwood, Solutions Engineer at HashiCorp. Dan will run through various options uh, to uh, connect uh, your Kubernetes environment with other resources. Please note that this session will be recorded and we will be sending you in a day or two a link to uh, the recording. Um, the session will last approximately 15 minutes. In order to stick to the time frame, we won't have the opportunity to take questions at the end of the session. However, we encourage you to use the tab at the bottom of your Zoom uh, uh, screen called Q&A to ask questions uh, during the session and we'll answer them as we go along. Uh, with that, let's go and get started. Uh, over to you, Dan. Well, thank you, Gwen. Hello, everyone. Hope you can see me and hear me. And thanks very much for joining us on the snapshot. Uh, today, we're going to be covering how console can simplify your microservices networking. That's working cool. My name is Dan Kirkwood. As Gwen mentioned, I'm a solutions engineer at HashiCorp. And I'm really looking forward to spending the next sort of 10, 15 minutes with you on today's topic. Um, here is everything that we're going to be covering today. Um, as we're pretty short on time, I'm going to get straight into it. So Kubernetes and networking. Um, I'm not going to cover the basics of Kubernetes. I hope you're aware of what it is and what it does. Um, what I want to say is that, you know, container orchestration platforms like Kubernetes, they allow us to deploy and manage applications and microservices at scale. However, they introduce new challenges and complexities, especially in the networking realm. Um, now, traditional networking concepts like fixed IP addresses, VLANs, routers don't apply in this environment. And, and many of the security controls that are quite mature and have built up over many years uh, that could be associated with something like a VLAN completely disappear. So what are the native networking constructs for Kubernetes? Uh, we have the, the most basic constructs that we have around a workload in Kubernetes, which is a pod. Pods have IP addresses that are local to your cluster. And these pods uh, exist for a certain lifetime. They could be rescheduled at any time. And that IP address is dynamic and can change. Okay, so there's a bit of a challenge here of how do I keep track of my workloads if they exist in pods that have dynamic IP addresses that could change at any time. So Kubernetes provides um, an abstraction away from individ individual pods with services. So I can use a cluster IP node port or a load balancer service and I can expose a single address and or a port or a set of ports uh, for my internal cluster services or for someone to consume my workload externally. Uh, Kubernetes also offers native service discovery of those services through multiple mechanisms. And there's also a plugin architecture through the, the container network interface um, that lets me extend that networking into other technology areas. Um, service, service authorization, so thinking about something like a service mesh is another layer that we can put on top of this networking. Um, but if we think about most service mesh offerings, they are focused pretty much exclusively on Kubernetes itself. And this brings me to the main challenge with these native methods. It's that they are defined by and they are mostly locked to the deployment platform itself. Okay, and the problem here is that your application architecture does not exist on Kubernetes only. All right, think about your cloud compute, database, API services, serverless, let alone think about anything that exists on prem. Integrating these with Kubernetes introduces a potentially overwhelming amount of complexity. However, of course, there is another way. And at HashiCorp, we focus on workflows over technology and we see a pretty consistent challenge around managing dynamic networking, no matter what your deployment platform is, Kubernetes or not, and no matter which cloud, whether it's IaaS, public cloud or, or private cloud that you choose. So if you think about console, with console, I can keep track of my services in a central registry, which scales well into the tens of thousands. Our largest console deployment is about 40,000 nodes within a single data center. I can perform detailed health checks on my services and I can load balance between healthy instances. 
Okay, I can use console to enforce encrypted and authorized sessions between all of my microservices with a service mesh. Um, now, this doesn't mean that I'm replacing all of those, those either Kubernetes native or cloud native constructs. I can keep them you know, where they make sense. Uh, but the main point here is that this experience is first class within Kubernetes, but also first class within the rest of your environment. My service registry and my service mesh can incorporate multiple kube clusters, um, other container orchestration systems, virtual machines. You know, however I choose to deploy a service, they are represented as equal within console. Now, the best way to explore this is actually to see how it works. So I'm gonna jump into a little demo environment here. Okay, so here I have a single Kubernetes cluster running on GCP. At the moment, I don't have any applications deployed. I do have an application endpoint here, but it's not really pointing to anything. I do have console deployed in this environment down here on the lower right. At the moment, console is just keeping track of a few internal elements. So let's deploy our app and see what happens. So as part of my application, I have three services. I have a front end payments and a checkout service. And we can see that those services have automatically registered within console once they've been deployed into Kubernetes. So I have a single instance for my front end and my checkout, and I have three instances for my payment service. Console is keeping track of the health of those services and now will return them as part of my service registry. So I should now be able to see my application. And we can see here that I'm hitting the front end of my application. That application, that front end, sorry, is able to reach out to the two other services, checkout and payments. And we see a little bit of kind of metadata around those services. And what we'll see is that because the payment services has three healthy instances, console will start load balancing me between the available healthy instances each time that this application makes a request, which it does as part of this, this API check. So I'm getting a 200 return, which is all good. Now that's at kind of the control plane layer. I wanna look into the data plane as well. And, and you know, how do we actually do this service authorization using console service mesh? So to do that, I can look at intentions and I have a few set up here already. The basic intentional rule that I have for authorization in my service mesh is that actually no service should be able to talk to another service. So you see how that defined here, all services to all services are denied. There are then a few rules that I've built up on top to allow my front end to be able to communicate with individual services. So what I can do here is remove one of these rules. So I'm allowing front end to talk to payments. Let's get rid of that. And what we can see here is that my application still has a control plane view of the service. You can still find out where that service exists thanks to console. But now that I'm not allowing those two services to talk, I'm getting an error back through my API. So it's as easy as that to define what I, I want my um, service mesh communication pattern to look like. And it's very easy to add that back in. I can say from front end, to payments, I want to allow. And that'll come back. Okay, so that's looking all good within my single Kubernetes cluster. But of course, today we're talking about how do I get outside of this Kubernetes cluster and how does console help me do that? So I want to think about a scenario where we have another application element that I want to consume, which is a recommendation service. It's being built by another team. Now that team is also working in Kubernetes, which is great. However, they have a preference for AWS. So of course they're consuming the Elastic Kubernetes service. Uh, this is a potential challenge, right? I've now got two application elements that I need to be able to talk, but they're in completely different clouds within completely different clusters. This isn't a problem because console has a simple mechanism uh, for federating Kubernetes clusters via what we call a mesh gateway. Now the mesh gateway allows our console deployments to share service information and it also gives a data path for fully encrypted communications between my GKE cluster and anything that I want to consume, for instance, my recommendation service in EKS. So let's update the application here. Now 
Now, from the console side, we can actually see that console has a view of what I've defined as two logical data centers. Okay, one for GCP, another for AWS. If we look into the services within AWS, we can see the recommendation service, which has five instances that are healthy and available to be consumed. Okay, we can also see that console has registered these mesh gateways as services as well. And if we now take a look at the application. Okay, that's great. So you can see here that my front end is now able to communicate with the recommendation service. Console is doing exactly the same load balancing between the five healthy instances of that recommendation service. Everything is encrypted end to end between the front end and this service, even though they're in two different clouds, even though they're in two very separate Kubernetes clusters. And the same rules, if we look at our intentions, the same rules apply around authorization. So I've had to allow this communication pass to take place because I've defined that I want to decide which, communicate, which services are allowed to communicate. So that's great, we federated two clusters. However, the point of this session is how do we get outside of Kubernetes? So let's look at another scenario. Let's say now I've got um, an application service that I want to consume that falls outside of Kubernetes. Now there's two flavors that I've got up on the screen here. Um, on the lower right there, we've got the arrow pointing to, let's say that's an EC2 instance. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the native service mesh experience can extend to virtual machines. So I can install console in my EC2 environment. I can have the same um, proxies that I'm using for my service mesh exist in, in EC2 very easily. And I could bring that service into the environment exactly the same as though it was a container underneath my, my Kubernetes orchestrator. However, I wanna look at a little, little bit of a different scenario. Let's say that we now want my application to consume data from a database. A database. However, that database has been deployed within AWS as an RDS managed instance. Um, now this brings up kind of a challenge on two levels. One level is I've now got data, you know, that is potentially sensitive customer data that I need to expose from one cloud to an application that lives in another cloud. This is a challenge as to how you do this. Second challenge, um, you know, the, the RDS instance that I've got here is not something that is custom, customizable in the same way that a EC2 instance would be. So there's no real way that I can install a binary on there. I can start doing configuration around that instance to bring it natively into my service mesh. Uh, Console has a solution for this as well called the terminating gateway. So to see what that looks like, Let's update our app again. And if we come back to AWS, we can see that I've got my RDS instance, which is MySQL registered as a service within console. Console is doing a health check against this database as well. So even though it's not part of some orchestrated system, I can still do first class health checking on this. I'm just doing a simple TCP check on the, the MySQL port to check that the instance is healthy and also to check, you know, the IP address associated with this managed instance could change. So I could register the possible IP addresses and check which one of those is healthy, check where I actually want to send traffic when someone uh, requests this service. The other thing that I can see is that I've registered this as an external service. So the console knows that anyone that requests this service, it needs to pipe the traffic through this terminating gateway to be able to reach the RDS instance. So in that way, I'm keeping that fully encrypted traffic flow for as long as possible. So I could place, and I've placed this terminating gateway within the same subnet as my RDS instance. I could also enforce TLS for this last hop. So I could install custom TLS certs, for the terminating gateway to communicate with that service if it supported that connection method. So if we check my application again, great, so now I can see my SQL, I can see where it lives, which is AWS and the IP address, and I'm getting my, my data plane check as well. 
So the traffic flow here is we've got my front end community communicating through the mesh gateway across to my other cloud through to the terminating gateway and then the last hop through to the database. All of it is encrypted end to end or at least up to the terminating gateway. And I can still do my authorization between which services should actually be able to request uh, or should be able to talk to the, the MySQL instance. The last thing that I want to talk about here is ingress. Okay, how do I expose this application to non-mesh services and users? You know, how do I begin TLS as soon as possible? How do I have a, a sort of a, a front gate layer of authorization for services in the mesh? Um, to do that, we use what's called an ingress gateway. And that's actually what I've been using for this demo. So if we were to take a look in Kubernetes, What you'll see here is that if I look at the services associated with my GCP cluster, I don't have my front end exposed at all through a service. So typically you might expose the front end through a, a load balancer for people to be able to get into this, into this application. I'm not exposing that at all. I'm exposing my ingress gateway behind a load balancer with a public IP and a port. And you'll see that this public IP and port matches what I've been accessing here. So what this does is it means that I can start my TLS as soon as possible. I can start doing a level of kind of routing with the, the proxy that lives at that layer. And I can start doing authorization straight away behind the load balancer. And I don't have to sort of expose my application element out to, out to the public internet. Um, now, everything that you've seen here for the gateways is based on the Envoy proxy for the data plane. If we think about the ingress gateway, you know, there is a little bit more uh, potential configuration that you'd want to do around how do you route requests into the service mesh. So I'm using Envoy here. We also have integrations with the um, ambassador for, for ingress. This is something that's that's changing quite rapidly. So this is something to, to keep an eye on is, is how do we do ingress into the, the console service mesh. That's it for the quick demo. Um, to wrap up, I'll bring this back. Okay, so I hope that you liked what you saw. I hope that it made sense and I hope that it's got you thinking about how you could extend a Kubernetes deployment using console. If it has got you interested, um, you can visit console.io. There's a download button there and you can get started. Everything that I've shown you today comes from our, our open source products. Um, once you've got started, if you need a little bit of a guide on you know, how to work with console and Kubernetes or console and, and other environments, visit learn.hashicorp.com and we've got plenty of guides there to, to walk you through. Otherwise, we are right on time. So I want to say thank you. Uh, my email is there if you want to reach out, have a chat, ask me a question, please do. Our link is there for snapshots and otherwise I will pass it back to Gwen. Thank you, Dan. Awesome demo. Uh, so this brings us uh, to the end of the session uh, today. I trust that you found it uh, valuable and useful. Thanks again for joining today. And a huge thank you to Dan for presenting. And again, don't forget to join uh, the next step shot, which is on various workloads with Nomad. And the user registration URL is showing at the very bottom of the slide that's currently presented. Once again, thank you.